Tom Lake out and um, forage uh, extension specialist with the Ag Center. I primarily work in North Louisiana. Um, I actually have a little bit of research work and uh, I work a lot with Buddy Pittman uh, here at the station and some over at Red River uh, and things. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this study that you see behind me. Um, this has to do with soil health, which is kind of a uh, topic of interest, I guess, if you read a lot in the popular press and things like that. We worked on there. We've had about three grants working on soil health. We're looking at it in a pasture situation, a perennial warm season grass pasture, uh, not in the cover crop sense for row crops or anything like that. Um, we worked at a producer's place several years ago. Um, well, all right, if you know some or read something about soil health, if you know kind of the three big uh, issues that they put out there or, or soil protection type things is to keep the, keep the ground covered, uh, use a diversity of species, and uh, oh, and living roots, have living roots uh, present all the time. Now, in a perennial warm season grass, you pretty much have that uh, already taken care of. Because uh, Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, it may go dormant, but it's still covering the soil. So it's protecting it from rainfall hitting directly on the soil and the runoff. Uh, you're probably going to have diverse species, unless you follow Ron's recommendations, then you're going to have a monoculture. I'm just kidding uh, about the, the weed control, but a lot of us are certainly going to have diverse species. You're going to have several different species of the, of the perennial grasses uh, also. Kind of hard to keep a specific Bermuda behavior or something like that without other things coming in like crabgrass and those kind of things. And uh, and basically a perennial warm season grass, those roots are alive in the winter, so you've got a live root. Now they're not really actively growing, uh, but you still have a live root in the soil uh, and things. So, it, so you kind of check off all those uh, or the first few things that we talk about in, in uh, protecting the soil when you start. But uh, we have looked at uh, several things with, and I mentioned we worked with a producer, a study on a place there. He was overseeding multiple species, basically all kinds of grasses, legumes, and brassicas. And, uh, so when we got to working with that, it's like, what do these do individually? I mean, does this diversity help you or does it have an impact in the pasture and things? So we took those species and basically we're looking at uh, what we call three functional groups and that's the legumes, the grasses, and the brassicas. Uh, we've got four different legumes planted. We use ball clover, crimson clover, white clover, and red clover. Uh, we've got four different grasses, uh, cereal rye, ryegrass, oats, wheat that we just mix together and, and put on these plots. And then the brassicas, we use uh, the turnips, uh, radish, and um, what else, buddy? And one other that we that we have in there. Oh, rape uh, are in there. Now, we have these in combination some of these plots, uh, you'll see just the legumes, some of them you'll see just grasses, some you'll see the legumes and the grasses, some are just for the brassicas. So we're looking at, at the mixtures, all combinations of those in mixes, and also uh, as just planting those specific functional groups and what, and what that differs uh, in things. Now we imposed on that, and you can see the red flags of the orange flag. From that red flag to this red flag, we do a different harvest treatment on that section versus between the next red flag. One of the trees, some of the treatments we, we were removing uh, the vegetation at, periodically through the year. One of the treatments, we let it grow as long as it would or, or whatever. We basically went to late April and we just mulched it on the surface. Uh, we just took a mower, a mulching mower, and left it 
clay and just mulched it down, left it flat on the surface, dig it. Basically, that would be considering this a cover crop in a perennial warm season grass and not really a forage crop uh, in things. Now, after about three years, uh, or after three years of that, I can tell you that one thing we found uh, on this study and, and others that we've done is if you go into a managed pasture or a hay field or something like that that's been managed pretty well, it is hard to change the soil health in that situation. Most perennial grass or perennial grass pastures are often used as the standard when they compare using cover crops in the row crop field. They look at, well, here's what you can achieve in a perennial grass that we're, we're targeting on this cover crop in row crop situations. So we found that it's kind of hard. Now, and that's not a, not a new revelation or anything. So basically, if you start going to these uh, uh, soil health <coughs> type work things, the first thing you're going to probably do is you're going to start changing the microbial uh, population in the soil. And we are measuring that. We see a shift in the micro microbiology uh, that's happening in these soils. We're working with a microbiologist uh, on this project also. Uh, but what we're not seeing is a measurable production response in the Bermuda grass. Uh, and that's what we're kind of targeting is, if we build soil health, do we get a response in the Bermuda grass uh, from that year? And after three years, we're not really seeing that. Uh, we do have in the last uh, the last year, we got some response in the Bermuda grass to where we mulched it versus where we removed that, uh, that material. Uh, but if you really look at the data, we mulched about a ton and a half of material, about three or three to four thousand pounds of material that was on that plot when we mulched it. So we gave up that much forage just to mulch it on the, on the plot. We only gained about 7 to 800 people a little less than a ton in Bermuda grass for the following that versus where we have removed it. So it's kind of a, or to me, that's not a real good trade off if I'm giving up a ton and a half of, of forage to gain less than a ton of forage on the other end. I, you know, that's not necessarily where, uh, where I want to be. So hopefully, uh, over years, and, and typically, as I mentioned with the uh, microorganism shift, you'll start seeing that early on, but to get to the carbon and the nitrogen dynamics in that system take a lot longer than that shift in microorganisms, and that's kind of where we are. If we haven't shifted the carbon and the nitrogen levels very far in that system. Uh, when you put it on a perennial grass uh, system there. And, that, and, and that's going to be pretty typical because, like I say, they use perennial grasses as sort of the standard that they measure how much, you're, how much achievement you're making if you use cover crops and things like that. So trying to change that system and, and really build that, hey, I'm going to where I don't need fertilization and things like that, it's going to take years. No matter what your management is, a soil is going to go to some kind of equilibrium. And as long as you don't change that management for several, if you've done it for several years, your soil, as far as microbials and nutrients and all that's going to get to some equilibrium and it's going to stay there. If you shift the management, then that equilibrium is going to change, but it isn't going to change in the first year or two. It's going to take time. And typically with the carbon part of that and the nitrogen part of that, it may take 10, 12, 15 years before you get back to an equilibrium if you don't change again what your management is. So I guess the sort of take home uh, story that here is, if you're working to improve soil health, 
in your pasture or hay field, it's going to take you time to do that. You're not going to see a major response after one or two or three years. We're not seeing a major response after three years. And that's been several, uh, that's three different studies uh, that we've done over time. And, and we don't see that just big jump uh, early on. Uh, and with that, I think I'm, I think Buddy's going to take questions, right? So, uh, does anybody have any questions about what we're doing or or uh, any other speculation I can make? Uh, yes, I am.
that kind of tells you what, that it's not going to kill the bean. They don't grow them. So, so it's not as strong a chemical as, uh, as the 2,4-D. Uh, you know, they don't take out buttercup if that's the target that you're looking at. And things. But again, it's not really, it's not on the label to be used in pastures unless it's alfalfa. Anything else? 